The Monster Below by Greenback, read by Deathlight, Chapter 14, The Next Wonder of the World. I scarcely noticed the ponies outside the tube as they flipped knobs, pressed buttons, and drained the stasis fluid, leaving me dangling in a harness, barely able to look away from my wings, even as I shivered at the bitter cold. Several ponies and lab coats took hold and guided me onto a walkway, where the harness and breathing mask was removed. Drowsy and cold, I tried to stand, but collapsed. My legs weak and unable to support myself. The lab ponies parted as Beatbreaker came forward, relieved to see me. You're weak, she said, putting a hoof on my shoulder. That's perfectly normal. My teeth chattered uncontrollably. Is it normal to, to, to feel like a popsicle? Beatbreaker chuckled. Glad to see your sense of humor still intact. Taking a thick blanket from one of her assistants, she wrapped it around me as I was taken to the showers, where the last of the stasis fluid was washed away with a luxurious hot water. Then came a quick dunk in a jacuzzi, where just a hot water blasted into my weakened muscles. Then I was hopped to an examination room, where Beatbreaker did a physical and injected me with all matters and needles. I would have freaked out so many times had my attention not been on my wings. When all was said and done, and Beatbreaker decided I was in good health, aside from slightly atrophied muscles, I was up to the cafeteria where Beatbreaker instructed me to eat as much as I wanted, so as to get my strength back up. Though I still had the aftertaste of chemicals and drugs in my mouth, I was all too happy to comply, wolfing down huge portions of whatever was put in front of me, oblivious to the other ponies in the room. The other patients didn't give me a second glance, figuring I was one of them. But the medical personnel knew the significance of my wings and couldn't take their eyes off me. So, I asked Beatbreaker, my voice sore from my long dormant vocal cords. How long was I out? Two months. I paused, fork halfway in my mouth. You're serious? Your body has muscles where there weren't any before. It took a long time for the new nerves and attachments to grow in. We were going to wake you up a month after, but it seemed like your body was rejecting the muscles. So I had more growth hormones injected, along with steroids to see if they would help. And did they? By all appearances, yes. Co-Encounter and the others will be happy to hear that. They came by frankly to watch you. Beatbreaker chuckled. In fact, a lot of ponies did. You were quite the attraction. And, if I may say so, you're quite cute when you sleep. I blushed. Cute? Oh yes, did you know you curl up when you sleep? You look so sweet and innocent in there, especially when you're turned upside down. My cheeks turned bright red. Oh, don't worry, a lot of ponies do that when they're under. But you're definitely the cutest one I've seen. You were watching me? Of course, I need to keep watch of your vitals. Couldn't your assistants do that? Well, yes, but I want to watch over you specifically. After all, you're not just a patient, you're... She trailed off, and I was curious to hear her answer, but my stomach growled again, and I silenced it by finishing my salad, and starting to slurp my smoothie. So, when do we work these out? I flexed my wings, but the soreness made me stop. Not for a few days, you need to get your strength back. Oh, we can do that as we go, right? Beatbreaker chuckled. You'll need every ounce of strength you can muster to deal with your wings. It's probably going to take a few months before you can even fly on your own. I couldn't believe her. I'll cut that time in half. You remember what happened to that one mare who was too impatient to wait, don't you? Realizing the beat breaker probably knew what she was talking about, I backed down. Well, I guess you're right about that. Beat breaker gave me a warm smile. Don't worry, Silver Speak. You'll fly. And I'll be there to help you along the way. She reached out, touching her hoof to mine. I promise. I hadn't expected Beatbreaker to touch me like that. I wasn't sure how to react, especially the way she looked at me. Was it with compassion, or professional friendliness, or something else? I couldn't tell. Well, I'm looking forward to it. But I guess I got a lot of smoothies to go through before I get there. Beatbreaker chuckled as I finished my smoothie and began another one. I didn't care if it was going to take me thousands of smoothies to get up into the air or if it would take hundreds of hours of weightlifting, or anything else Beatbreaker was going to toss my way. I'd do whatever it took. 
Those two beautiful wings upon my back were all that mattered. I was as patient as could be expected while regaining my strength. Though my muscle loss wasn't as severe as the pony had been lying in bed for months. I had to do a lot of walking and weightlifting to get myself back into shape. And I was eager to get working in the tower's gym. And with Beat Breaker and my therapist, I began my regimen. Spending a month building up my overall strength. Mixing between lightweights and my repetitions. And heavy weights with few lifts. Finally the day came where I'd get started working on my wings. It had been tricky getting used to having new limbs on my back. Especially learning how to fold them up, take showers, and sleeping with them. But I was ready for them to send me into the sky. But as I quickly learned, Beatbreaker had been right in saying I'd need all my strength to use my wings. Because my new muscles had never been used. I started with the lightest weight possible. I scoffed, figuring that my new appendages would be able to handle one pound dumbbells. By the end of my first session, my muscles were so sore I couldn't lift them. Things are going to be tougher than I thought. Thus began my quest to master flight. I spent most of my time in the gym working on my back and wing muscles, trying to increase my strength a little more each day, and experiencing soreness I never could imagine. Several days, Beatbreaker and I had to skip exercises because I was too sore to do anything but walk. On those days, I rested, doing little by reading and doing laps on the gym's track. When she wasn't busy in the lab or with other patients, Rebreak would try to spend time with me, usually reading books with me, joining me for a few laps, or help me wash when my limbs are too sore to clean my back. Something I was extremely grateful for. And when I was rested up, I would hit the gym harder than before, forcing myself through the pain of the muscles being pushed to their limits. Hissing as I performed one more exercise, one more set, and one more repetition through the sensation of fire beneath my skin. The work paid off, in 5 months I went from being able to only do 10 wing push ups to 40. My shoulder muscles went from lifting 30 pounds to 70. And the fat gave way to muscle as I got in the best shape of my life. 7 months after we started, with Beat Breaker standing beside me, and several aides ready to catch me, I flexed my wings atop a table. Taking a deep breath, I began to flap. Slowly at first, then faster and faster. And while I was beating as quickly as I could, I yelled and jumped. I didn't fall. Opening my eyes, I saw my hooves were dangling above the floor, my wings beating smoothly and efficiently. But the sensation lasted only for a few seconds before my muscles got sore and I dropped to the floor. Beat breakers and the others rushed forward, but I said I was fine. In fact, I was more than fine. I was ecstatic, for all my hard work had paid off. I, an earth pony, had hovered. Progress was quick as I threw myself at my workouts like never before. My hover time increased from 5 seconds to 10, then 20, and finally a minute, and then 5. With Beat Breaker satisfied that my progress was good enough, we tried flight, which was handled by running down the track, then leaping over a foam pit and flapping my wings. I thought it'd be easy, but hovering was one thing, and flying another. My first attempt ended with me embedded in foam, my hind legs kicking like a rabbit stuck in a hole. I kept at it, on every jump, I went a little further than before. I began to fly for short distances, nowhere near what I hoped. But Beat Breaker pointed out that for a pony who only changed from an earth to a pegasus, I was doing well. The day finally came when I crossed the pit with the help of my wings, and immediately rushed into advanced flight. But like my first attempts at hovering and flying, I failed miserably. Turning, adjusting my altitude, and keeping a steady speed was diabolically difficult. And after a week of constantly crashing into the floor, I asked Beat Breaker why it was so much harder than anything that came before. She theorized that Pegasi Pines were used to three-dimensional thinking. Rather, rather than the two-dimensional ones that Earth and Unicorn Ponies have. Their brains can handle constant input and adjustment, and make fixes almost instantly. But my brain had to be rewired itself to learn all this from scratch. I kept trying, over and over again, I kept trying the simplest of maneuvers. But it was hard to focus on not just flapping my wings, but adjusting my speed, plotting a course and keeping track of where everything was. Failure after failure bombarded me, 
and my day has ended with me drenched in sweat, with muscles locking up after being pushed beyond the breaking point. But no matter how many scrapes I got, or how many bloody noses I obtained, I refuse to give up. This is my dream, and I would rather die than quit after coming so far. But my refusal to quit was born from Bee Breaker asking me what I would do with my wings. And unto her, I put many hours of thought into that matter, and decided that I'd be a model to others, an inspiration to Equestria's youth. In my mind, I saw myself flying over Equestria, doing good deeds wherever I went, inspiring others to rise above their limitations. I would be a hero from a comic book, the one who would inspire the next generation to pursue their own dreams, no matter how impossible they seemed. As the months passed, I began to see progress. I could stay in the air longer, and my flight looked more natural. And after another five months, I was finally able to navigate the obstacle course successfully. I was nowhere near winnable material, but I could barely pass as a pegasi to the casual observer. Delighted, Bee Breaker said I was ready for the next stage of my training, open air flight. It was a beautiful morning when Bee Breaker and I left the tower. The first time I had done so in over a year. The legem had plenty of windows and views to the outside world. It was strange to breathe fresh air and be in the open once again. But if we didn't linger, heading to the Manhattan docks, where Coin Counter and Metacom CEOs waited on enormous yachts. As soon as we climbed aboard, the craft headed out into the open sea, until Manhattan was a blimp on the horizon. Once it had vanished, the yacht came to a stop, and our plan was reviewed. Because Metacom didn't want their spokes pony to die a very messy death, they wanted me to practice my first open air flights over water instead of the unyielding earth. It'd be safer, in theory that is. Slamming into water at net big speeds would break my neck and liquefy what was left of me. And for that reason, two biggest head ponies came along to catch me in case of an accident. With three unicorns to cushion the blow, should I slip through the biggest head's grasp. I was nervous, yet giddy, as everyone took their positions. Everyone on the yacht was there because of me. And the best protection possible was being provided to keep me safe. Who wouldn't want to feel like a VIP for a day? When everyone was ready, Bee Breaker came up to me. Remember Silver Speak, take it slow and steady. She reminded me. Enjoy the flight, but don't go overboard. I got this. No need to be nervous. I just don't want you to get hurt, that's all. Don't worry. I said, spreading my wings. I won't. She didn't reply, looking almost like my mother when I had done a dumb thing as a cult. Sprinting, I beat my wings and leapt off the boat. My wings catching the wind and sending me up. The pigus had pony staying close, but leaving me room for maneuvering and dashing about. I started the routine that Beat Breaker and I agreed on. Duplicating the exercises from the gym. A few long loops and one fast one. A quick spin to ensure I could keep my balance. And then a steep dive, only to pull up at the last second. I pulled them all off with no problems. And a fly by the yacht showed Bee Breaker and the CEOs nodding, delighted at my progress. With the main test over, I was free to try any moves I wanted, within reason of course, and decided to practice on speed. I started to loop around the cruiser, my organs sloshing from one side of my body to the other as the g-forces kicked in. But I didn't care about the nausea, for the sensation of speed was intoxicating. I was flying out in the open, as free as a bird. It would go anywhere I wanted, without worrying about magic wings wearing out. The sky was mine, and I was relishing it. The faster I went, the more giddy I became, doing even faster loops. Delighted in getting sporadic glimpses of Beat Breaker and the CEOs, who looked very pleased that I was doing so well. But why stop there when I could really impress them? But why stop there? I headed up to the sky and did a vertical loop, only to realize that perhaps this wasn't such a good idea. Reaching the top of the loop, I stopped beating my wings so I could head downwards, only to have a horrible instant of weightlessness as I looked down to the ocean quickly rising up towards me. Having never gone so high before, I panicked, clapping my wings hard as I started to fall. The biggest I pony shot in, but I managed to recover, and indicate that I was alright. Shaking my head, I realized that a failed move wasn't going to impress the CEOs. 
If I was gonna show off to the public, what a winged earth pony could do, I'd have to know a few tricks. I tried the loop again, and had the horrible sensation of weightlessness as I reached the peak. But this time I was ready, and made the smooth dive until I was level with the horizon. Elated, I did three more loops, each one faster than the last. And though I couldn't see the faces of the ponies below, I easily visualized them looking up at me. Got smacked in complete awe of how unquestionably awesome I was. Why, perhaps with a few more years of practice, maybe I'd become a member of the Wonderbolts. And the first Earth, or rather former Earth pony to do so. Getting an idea, I checked my muscles, I was already getting tired, but could hold out for one more trick before calling it a day. And I was going to make it the best one yet. Taking a deep breath, I flew towards the clouds above. My wings flapping for everything they were worth, and I went faster and faster, until it was like I could actually touch the white fluffiness. Beyond them lay the cloudless sky and the sun. I was going to see it. Or at least, I thought I would. Because it seemed like my head was suddenly light and weightless. My vision went fuzzy. The next thing I knew, I was falling. My legs dangling before me, and my wings billowing uselessly to my sides. Blinking, I tried to figure out what was going on. Only to realize I was falling towards the sea at breakneck speed. Panicking, I tried to beat my wings, but realized I was going too fast. There was no way to pull up in time before hitting. Then the Pegasus ponies were swooping in, and caught me, beating their wings to slow us all down. But even their combined efforts couldn't bring us up fast enough. And we were spared a hard landing when a huge, transparent cushion appeared beneath us, which as we submerged when we hit, it slowed us down enough that we only got wet and were magically lifted to the deck, where I collapsed in a heap. Silver speak! We Breaker shouted, running over as I fell to my knees on shaky legs. Are you okay? What happened? I asked. You fainted, went higher than you should have. Your body couldn't get enough oxygen. She cursed something in her native tongue. I should have remembered that. Coin Counter came over. Is that something you can fix? We Breaker shook her head. It could be avoided temporarily with an oxygen spell, but his body will have to get used to flying at higher altitudes. The CEO nodded, looking at me. When you go up next, Silver Speak, please be more careful. It took a few moments before I was able to gather my thoughts. Don't worry, I don't think I'll be flying again today. Aside from nearly scaring the CEOs to death by seeing their prized possession plunge from the sky like a rock, the flight had been successful. Not knowing that I could fly my own, Bee Breaker repeated the same exercise over the next few weeks. Each flight getting better and better. I was even able to go a little higher each time, my body acclimating itself to the greater heights. Fewer CEOs went on the subsequent cruises, but Coin Counter was always there, eager to watch as I worked, and congratulating me on doing well when I came down for a landing. He was there on my last day, wearing a big smile as he handed me a glass of water. What are you so happy about? I asked. I think you're ready. He said. For what? To make a public debut. I had known that it would eventually be revealed to the world at large. I would pondered the thought myself over the past several flights, wondering when Medicom would want to show off their latest achievement to the world. Now the moment had come, and with it, a momentary hesitation. Going public was a big step, and not to be taken lightly, but I've been preparing myself for over a year. I had taken all these flights, worked myself sore more times than I could count, and even learned some tricks to prove my newfound abilities. Continuing to practice would gain me little. Well? Coin Counter asked. What do you think? Are you ready to dazzle Equestria? I don't think I'm ready. I told him. He was stunned, but I quickly added. I know I'm ready. Chuckling, Coin Counter wiped the sweat from his brow. That's exactly what I hope to hear. In no time at all, preparations were underway as Metacom prepared for what was to be the biggest press conference ever. And when the big day arrived, I found myself backstage, endlessly adjusting my tie and fidgeting as I tried to compose myself. This was my big public debut, and I didn't want to screw it up. Don't worry so much. Beebreaker teased. You look fine. You sure? Because I'm not sure this is my best tie. 
Maybe there's another one around who I can borrow. Rolling her eyes, V Breaker adjusted her glasses and looked me over. You look fine, you have nothing to worry about. I knew Bee Breaker was right, but the confidence from my flight tests were gone. Replaced with a growing unease. Sorry, it's just, well, I've never been the subject of a press conference. I peeked towards the curtain, listening to the reporters setting up beyond it. You got any tips for being in the spotlight? Be yourself, put on a nice smile, and relax. Picture yourself as the embodiment of... what's the word? Awesomeness? Awesomeness? Really? She nodded. It helped me. An aide came up. 29 seconds, Miss Beat Breaker. Thank you. Setting towards the stage, Beat Breaker paused, putting a hoof under my chin. This is your moment to shine, Silver Speak. If this is truly what you're meant to do, then everything will be fine. Point counter walked out from behind the curtain. Bee Breaker smiled, adjusted my tie, and followed after as Coin Counter went on stage and began his speech. Baz and Genicals, thank you for joining us today. Hanging to my designated spot behind the curtain, I breathed deeply to calm myself. It wasn't easy with the sound of hundreds of cameras going off, which would become a hurricane of noise when I walked out. Coin Counter continued to talk, reciting my carefully written speech to build up anticipation to a fever pitch. But, it wasn't needed. Metacom produced two miracles. The press expected a third one, and they would get it. As I tried to calm my pounding heart, a thought came to me. In some ways, this was the end. The moments I spent behind the stage were the last moments I'd have was an unknown pony. Once I headed out onto that runway, I'd be a celebrity. Every move I made in public would be watched and scrutinized. And return to my old life would be impossible. This walk would be a one-way trip. I present to you the next wonder of Metacom technology, where we can now give legs to those who have lost them, and wings to those who once had them. We can now give the gift of flight to ponies who always wanted it. It was too late to run, but I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to let my fear get to me. This was my once-in-a-lifetime chance to make something of myself, and I'd be a fool to flee from it. Mez and General Colt, I give you, the first Earth Pony given artificial wings. The curtains parted, and I was assaulted by a literal wall of lights, momentarily blinding me. Instinct kicked in, I almost retreated, but I didn't. I walked onto the runway, trying to ignore the fear as I put one hoof in front of the other, taking that one-way trip out of my old life. The lights kept flashing. I adopted the most handsome, dashing face I could. Pretending that I was a model at a fashion show, the pride and envy of everyone in the audience, hoping it would distract me from wanting to throw up. But it got easier with every step. Being the focus of this much attention was something I had never felt before. There was charged with the energy, and I could feel the astonishment of those around me. The star you see before you was born an Earth Pony. Coin Counter continued. He had no magic and no flight abilities of any kind. Yet he had a dream to rise above the earth and fly among the sky. Fate said he would never do so, but we have allowed him to fulfill that dream. And the dreams of other earth ponies who wish to soar like the Pegasi brethren. The cameras continued to flash as photos were taken, but I was no longer afraid. It felt so good, so right, so intoxicating to be like this. History is being made, and I was the one doing it. This is my reward, my victory after so much work and effort, and I was going to enjoy it for all it was worth. I stretched out my wings and turned around, letting them be photographed from all angles, including the scarves where they had been attached. And then I leapt, hovering in mid-air. There was a gasp from the audience as I flew around the air. Doing a few quick tricks I had practiced relentlessly when I was over the ocean. It only lasted for a few seconds, but it had the desired effect of wowing the crowd. They knew the world would never be the same, and they had front row seats to watch it happen. Unable to resist, I raised my front legs high, as if beckoning them, like the princesses. And as I wanted, they went nuts, shouting out questions, snapping photographs like no tomorrow, and acting like worshippers before an angel that had descended from the heavens. I grinned, no, it's not like seeing an angel, it's like seeing a god. As the evening fell, I stood in the gym, looking outside the windows to the city below. 
from so high up, it's peaceful and tranquil, with life going on as normal, but it was an illusion. Editors, writers, and reporters were no doubt churning out as many copies of tomorrow's paper as they could, and then I woke up to the following morning. One of those papers lay outside my room, the headline announcing the medical miracle of the century. Medical bloodied ponies changed their race, and beneath that, a photo of myself on the walkway. As a pony, I never got any media attention before. This was a huge shock to myself. And to read about myself in the articles. And when I peered outside the window, I saw huge crowds gathering around the base of the tower. There was a knocking at the door. Opening it, I found Coin Counter and Beat Breaker standing there. Morning, Silverspeak. Coin Counter said, I trust you've seen the papers? I nodded. Wonderful. In fact, we got a public question and ask session scheduled for this afternoon. And I was hoping you'd join us. In reality, I had to go to this session. After all, why set one up, then have the star not show? I at least appreciated Coin Counters being polite about it, rather than order me to go. After all, I was still a Medicom employee, despite my new status. Of course I can come, I said. When the session was held that afternoon, I was amazed at how many ponies showed up. There must have been hundreds of them, if not at least a thousand. All of whom wanted to get a glimpse of me. Even behind the line of security guards and tables, I was still nervous. Not knowing what movie stars felt like when their own fans go nuts. As Coin Counter and Beat Breaker took their places, I looked over the crowd, wondering if there was any familiar faces. For I'd be happy to take questions from them over anyone else. But there was none I could see, save one. At the very back of the crowd, I could just make out the unmistakable face of the head librarian. My stomach tightened. Why was she here? A few seconds of frantic thought, and I concluded she was just curious to see an earth pony who got wings. Yes, that had to be it. The session began, and for the next hour, Coin Counter, Beat Breaker, and myself talked with the crowd, giving details about their operation, my recovery and training, and how it had taken a lot of work to get to where I was. Then came questions from the audience, most of them were directed towards me, and as difficult as it was to keep up with the barrage of questions, I was flattered and was quickly sucked up into the role of being suddenly famous. Delighted that the audience was giving me their undivided attention with each word I spoke. Still, I would occasionally glance towards the librarian. She didn't move, she just watched me. Her gaze piercing me, even from so far away. Whenever I saw that look, I quickly turned away. I had no desire to engage paranoia about what she was up to. I had been down that path before, and had no desire to repeat it. At last, the session came to an end with the announcement that Medicomp wanted me to try the wings out for a year, and see if they still worked. Then the company would open up the procedure to everyone who wanted a pair. Only then did the librarian leave, but not before he gave me that final glance. For the next month, life rushed ahead at neck-breaking speeds. Every day saw me waking up early from my new apartment in the tower. My old one was out of the question, as I'd be mugged trying to go in and out every day and attending any number of events. Talk shows, get-togethers, and public demonstrations sucked up my time, and it was common for me to come back to the Medicomp Tower late at night, clasp on the bed, and pass out, only to wake up the next morning and do it all over again. Still, I was having the time of my life, for I was the talk of the town. Every magazine, book, periodical, and pony media wanted to interview me, take photos, or both. Whenever I ventured outside, mobs of ponies swam around me, eager to see my wings for themselves. Yet, I didn't mind the attention. I was happy to pose for photos and give autographs. And soon I was amassing a collection of books, articles, fan letters, and everything related to my newfound fame. The public wanted to get all it could of silver speak, the next wonder of the world. The pony defied nature and forged his own path. But there was something I couldn't collect and display on a shelf. It was equally as important to me, if not more. Whenever I talked to Earth Ponies, there were nearly several who told me they shared the dream I had. They said I gave them hope for flights, and if I could get wings, then they could too. To hear that made me feel, well, like a superhero. Many a day ended with me grinning ear to ear, feeling on top of the world. 
Never tiring of hearing how I have given hope and inspiration to so many. Basking in the glow of my admirers, I thought the good times would never come to an end. It's hard to believe how the worst things can begin so simply and casually. While going through some fan mail one night, I came across one from a pony who didn't approve of what I was doing. Surprised, I rationalized it away, thinking that not every pony was going to be happy with what I was doing. After all, not every pony had been happy with the legs and wings, so why would this be any different? I didn't think about that letter for a few days, and I'd forgotten about it while visiting a talk show one day, going through my usual topics and discussions. And when we got to taking audience questions, I went through the usual ones, thinking that there were no questions that could surprise me at this point. Then one pony, a unicorn, raised his hoof. What the need for going against the grain? He asked. But don't you think changing your race is dangerous? Perhaps, I said. But who's to say the Earth Pony shouldn't get the same abilities as the Airborne Brethren? But what if every Earth Pony out there went to get wings? The Metacomp would be financially fit for the next thousand years. After the laughter from the audience died down, I kept talking. I don't think that's going to be a problem. Earth Ponies still have their talents. They still have their connections to the Earth. They grow food, they'd be the strongest and most durable ponies. They'd just be able to fly. But wouldn't the balance of the life be shuttered? We'd have too many Pegasi ponies flying around. Well, then we'd probably have a lot of farmers who could fly, I said. In fact, now that I think about it, wouldn't it be an improvement in some ways? Earth ponies are technically the strongest. So we'd have earth ponies who cannot fly, but would be stronger than normal Pegasus ponies. They'd be able to accomplish twice as much. The studio was silent. Are you suggesting? The unicorn asked. The Pegasus ponies would become obsolete? I quickly realized that things had gone horribly wrong. No, no, not at all. I stammered. I mean, not exactly. Just because I'm technically a Pegasus pony now doesn't mean I can manipulate the weather. I can't sit on clouds or fly fast enough to transfer rainwater from another part of Equestria. Earth ponies can't do any of those things, and I doubt they ever will. The audience remained silent. The host realizing things were quickly getting out of hand, quickly cutting a commercial break. The talk show became a huge fiasco in the papers over the next few days. Helen screamed about how I had discounted the Pegasus race, saying it was going to be obsolete once every pony could get wings. The tabloids were even worse, saying that I gleefully relished describing how the Earth ponies were going to overthrow the princesses and take over Canterlots, and that I got into a fistfight with the audience. Medicomp's lawyers were quick out that redacted. Coin Counter quickly held a press conference to assure the public that that wasn't the case at all. And I even went before the microphone to explain my position. But the damage had been done. I had figured ponies were smart, but I was shocked that the majority of ponies didn't believe the headlines over what I had to say. Judging by the letters to editors, among the volumes of mail sent to Metacomp and me, I waited for the controversy to die down, but it didn't. It seemed that not all of Manhattan was behind Metacomp and that the talk show incident gave him permission to come out of hiding. More articles and opinion pieces began to be published denouncing the company for interfering with what they shouldn't have messed with. And the more I read, the more I was shocked. I thought the ability to get wings would delight everyone. I couldn't fathom why there was so much negativity. Eating to recharge from going out in public so much, I stayed in the tower for a few days. Trying to forget about the public and the talk show fiasco by reading books, relaxing, and sharing meals with Bee Breaker in her apartment, but it didn't work. It certainly didn't help that whenever I saw Mangus, he sneered at me, no doubt enjoying seeing me make a fool of myself. Finally giving up my books one evening, I focused on reading the letters sent to me, wanting to see why opponents were so upset. Maybe I could figure out why and offer an appropriate answer. Half the letters I got supported me, saying that I had clearly been made to look like an idiot by the press. But the other half mainly ranted about how I was a racist, how I hated Pegasus ponies, how I wanted to blow up Cloudsdale, and other nonsense. When Bee Breaker came in, she saw my bloodshot eyes and immediately took the latest letter out of my hooves. You shouldn't read so much into this. She said putting a hoof on my shoulder. It's driving you crazy. I just don't understand, I said. I thought everyone would be happy to see wings like this. 
Many are. But not everyone. I just don't understand why. Be Breaker thought for a moment. Maybe because they're afraid. They're afraid that the ability to get wings is gonna throw the world into chaos. And as some might tell you, change isn't always good. I groaned. She put her other hoof on my shoulders. Don't stress so much. We just have to show them that you're still you. You're not a monster. I couldn't stress about what was happening, but I nodded in agreement. At that moment, I was just relieved that Beatbreaker was there, and more importantly, that she had my side. Co Encounter called an emergency meeting the following day with Beatbreaker and myself attending. The public relations situation, though not dire, was inching that way, and immediate action had to be taken to mend it. The floor was open to suggestions, and many came out. But one of the fellow CEOs suggested that perhaps we could have a public tour throughout all of Equestria, going from city to city to let ponies see and recognize that I wasn't a monster. Everyone present agreed that that was a good idea, myself included, not only because I can work towards making things better, but I was also looking forward to the idea of traveling outside Manhattan for a while. Hopefully, one of the stops would be Santa Lanka, for outside of a few letters, I haven't met my parents at the summer festival. And this would be a good time to do so. Besides, what better way to show off how far the sun had come than by showing off his wings? Arrangements were made and the train was charted. While most Medicons management would remain in Manhattan, Kunkata would come with us as well as Mangus and several his guards provide security. I was not at all happy about that, but I could accept the need for security. But I would have taken anyone over Mangus and his brutes. Still, the day of our departure finally arrived. With all of our things packed, Coin Counter, Beat Breaker, and myself got into the official carriage and were driven to the station, where a special train awaited, completely larger than normal cars, more elegant than your ordinary passenger train. Minicom wanted to make a big impression with this trip, and they were pulling out all the stops. When we boarded, the doors closed. Minicom's private train set off across Buckingham Bridge and began our tour of Equestria. Everyone else on the train was excited, myself included. Sitting in the lounge car, I watched as the bridge passed by, and the water below us sparkled under the sun. Everything seemed fresh and ready for us. Beyond the bridge lay all of Equestria, and countless other ponies who could be persuaded to see that this wasn't the work of an evil company, and that it could improve lives, like how it improved mine. I was confident we could persuade them to accept the idea. What we had to do, what I had to do, was win them over. Now really, how hard could that be?